Hey, everybody. Hello. Good morning. Almost good afternoon. Welcome to you. Welcome to all of our campuses joining us, as well as everyone joining us online. I'm so glad that you are here to be with us today. I'm glad to be here with you. My name's Brandon. I'm the Next Steps Pastor here at Grace, and it's a privilege to be here with you. We've got some special uh, time planned this morning, and uh, I'll warn you a little bit up front. It's going to be different. It's going to feel different. We're trying some new things. So just go with us, okay? Uh, as a matter of fact, maybe just to get us a little bit warmed up, would you just turn to someone nearby and just say, it's going to be different? At all of our campuses right now, go ahead. It's going to be different. <laughs> It's going to be different, but that's okay. I've been praying that God would use this time in a special way in your life and in my life. And uh, I believe he wants to meet us. So it should be a, a powerful morning. We're actually going to begin here in just a few minutes. We're going to take communion together. So hopefully you grabbed one of those communion items as we walked in uh, to wherever you are, whatever campus you're at. Uh, but before we get to communion, I wanted to spend some extended time in self-evaluation. Um, you know, in, in scripture, in 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul says this, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning bring judgment on themselves. So it's a very serious thing to sort of take stock before we engage with communion. And I want to do that a little bit with you this morning. Um, what I want to do is frame our time around the, a word, and the word is relationship. Relationship. When we trust in Jesus, when we place our faith in Jesus as our Savior, as our only way to heaven... We, our relationship with him changes. Uh, the scriptures talk about it in several different ways. They, they say that we have now a walk with Jesus, where every day we're walking with him, right? Jesus says that he will never leave us or forsake us. He calls us his friends. And so there's this intimate relationship, this connection that we now have with him. But it's also true, the scriptures also say that we should boldly approach the throne of Jesus, and so there's this sense where even though Jesus is present with us at all times, we have a choice of how we will engage with him in any given moment or on any given minute or day of our lives. And so I want you to think about relationships. Um, as you consider your relationship with Jesus, what kind of relationship would you say that it is? What, what does it feel like? What, when you experience your walk with Jesus, what is that like for you? Because there's lots of different kinds of relationships, right? We, we know this, we experience this. There's, you might have a relationship with your employer where you're always trying to stay on their good side, maybe get a raise or a promotion. Or maybe you have a, a friendship where you used to be very close with this person, but now you've kind of lost touch and you just catch up every once in a while. Or, or maybe there's a, a, a relationship of a married couple that even though they still live together, there just isn't friendship, there isn't love, there isn't closeness anymore. Lots of different kinds of relationships, but what would you say, how would you think about your relationship with Jesus? Because many times, many times, no matter how good things start off, they don't always stay that way, right? Things can happen that, that separate people or, or that cause them to drift apart. And so I think that can happen with Jesus as well. And as we move into communion here in just a few minutes, before we get that, I want to talk through a few areas. Common things that I think become barriers between us and Jesus. Probably as you hear me say that, there's one that jumps to your mind and it's this one sin, right? That's the first place I want us to start. Think about your life. Is there sin in your life? Um, there are things, as we begin walking closely with Jesus, he is gonna point out things that are incompatible with him. There are things that are opposite to his uh, will for us and his love for us. And so as we walk with him, he's gonna point those things out and he's gonna say, you gotta get that out of your life. But the challenge can be that sometimes sin can feel like a savior. Have you ever noticed that? When we walk through challenging, difficult, uh, troubling circumstances in our lives, sin is always right there ready to say, I can help, I can make you feel better. And so after, over years, if we engage with that, what can happen is sin starts to feel like hope. It starts to feel like comfort and security. And it can be very difficult to give those things up over time. But Jesus, all the while, Jesus is there pleading with us saying, no, those are false, fake saviors. I am your savior. I will be your hope. I will be your peace. I will be your joy and your stability. 
So when it comes to sin, what is in your life that is incompatible with or, or opposite to a close relationship with Jesus? We need to consider this area of sin. There's two other things though that I think often might go overlooked. Two other areas where it's easy, sin jumps to our minds, right? These other areas, maybe not so much. So I wanna show you a passage where Jesus talks about these things. Uh, this is Revelation chapter two. He's speaking to a local church, very similar to this one. And here's what he says to this church. It's the church in the city of Ephesus. Here's what he says to them. I know your works your toil and your patient endurance and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake and you have not grown weary, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first." Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. There's two other aspects that Jesus raises here that I wanna mention briefly before our time of communion. One is what I call religion. And what I mean by religion is the works that we do, the things we do for Jesus, okay? You hear Jesus talk about it here. He says, he talks about their toil. He talks about their enduring and their bearing up, how they're not growing weary. And notice that he says all those things in a very positive way. He's not saying those are bad. He's celebrating that with them. But then he goes on and what has happened, it seems, and what can happen if we're not careful with you and me is that these good things they were doing for Jesus, in the midst of working so hard for that, they lost sight of the person they were doing them for. And so I want you to consider, is there anything that you have been doing for Jesus that has become a distraction from Jesus. Maybe it's ministry at church. Maybe it's people that you serve and you care for and provide for. But is there anything that you're doing and you're doing it with the right heart for Jesus, but it now has become a distraction from him? When it comes to religion, has the work you do for Jesus become a barrier in your relationship with him? If so, it's possible that like this church and that we just read about, it's possible you left the love you had at first. The second thing I wanna look at here is tradition, tradition. Um, probably, what, what I mean by tradition is the ways we tend to approach Jesus, okay? So probably if you are someone who have been following Jesus for really any length of time, you probably have developed some traditions in how you engage with him. It might have to do with how you come to church, how you sing or worship. It might have to do with the ways you pray and, and engage Jesus in that moment of prayer. Or maybe it's in your personal devotional time when you, you know, every day or multiple times a week, you're getting up and, and you've got your alarm set and you're like, I know that at 6.30 sharp, I'm sitting down with Jesus. I got my coffee and I pray a specific prayer and then I open to this specific passage and I read it and then I play a worship song and it's like this whole, right, this whole thing that you've sort of orchestrated. And hear me. Those are good and helpful things. It is good to have ways that we engage with Jesus. Those things serve as tools to help us draw near to him. But if we're not careful, they can actually serve as a distraction from Jesus. As soon, it's possible so much that we're focused on these checklist of things. I gotta get through my rhythm, through all the things. And I actually forget that I'm supposed to be spending time with a person, with Jesus, so when it comes to tradition, have your methods of approaching Jesus been limiting your relationship with him? If so, it's possible that you've abandoned the love you had at first. So as we, as we prepare to move into this time of communion, the team here at Washingtonville, we're doing something a little different. They're gonna come out and they're gonna lead us through a song and we're gonna use this song as a time for us to engage and evaluate our lives. But just before we do that, I wanna talk just for a minute about communion because maybe you're new at Grace or maybe you're a newer follower of Jesus and so maybe communion is, is kinda of new for you. Communion is a special time where we look back, we reflect and we celebrate the sacrifice that Jesus made for us 
on the cross. These communion elements, there's nothing super special about them. Uh, There's a cracker that is bread that represents Jesus's body that was broken for us. And the juice represents his blood that was shed on the cross. And that's what communion is about. It's about remembering and celebrating and looking forward to his coming. If you're here and maybe you've never trusted in Jesus, maybe you're just checking it out. You're not sure what to think about all this. First of all, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. So grateful that you joined us. Um, It could be that this is the moment for you to trust and put your faith in Jesus as your savior. And if so, you could make that choice sitting right there in your seat and say, Jesus, I need you. I want you in my life. I need you to be my savior. I know I'm broken. I know I'm a sinner but I wanna come to you as my savior. If you make that decision, then this could be your celebration too. And we would love for you to join in with us. For those of us who have trusted in Jesus, let's take some time, let's take a few minutes and evaluate our relationship with him. When it comes to sin, what is in your life that is incompatible with or opposite to a close relationship with Jesus? When it comes to religion, Has the work that you've been doing for Jesus become a barrier in your relationship with him? Or when it comes to tradition, have your methods for approaching Jesus been limiting what he wants to do in you, in your relationship? So as the team here leads and guides us, this song is gonna walk us through some thoughts this way. I want you to engage with this and evaluate in your life. All of us, across all of our campuses, I'm gonna be out here, we're all taking a moment to pause and say, Jesus, what is in my heart that has become, maybe become a barrier or a distraction? Would you engage in this moment together for a few minutes? And then afterward, we'll come back and we'll take the communion elements together.
We're going to take the communion elements together across all of our campuses. So if you haven't already, go ahead and take those and open those up. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul is writing and he says this, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And we'll take the bread now. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together now. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus, we do that now. We proclaim your victory over death and sin on the cross. We celebrate your sacrifice on our behalf. Your love for us is overwhelming. And we look forward gratefully and expectantly to your coming. Jesus, thank you for walking closely with us in our lives, continue now in these minutes that we have together. Do a work, a special work in each of our lives. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for trying something new. We have some more ground to cover together. And so um, I want to stick with our same theme, though. Um, we talked about relationship, right? And, and there's areas that issues and things that come up in our relationship that tend to make it difficult for us to engage in a relationship with Jesus. I want to focus for the rest of our time, for the few minutes we have left, on one last area, and it's the area of shame. Shame. Um, I wonder, have, has anyone ever seen the Shark Tank, the show? This is Shark Tank, you know what I'm talking about, okay? Campuses, some of you have seen this. If you haven't, I'll just give you just a quick uh, kind of summary. So Shark Tank is, has nothing to do with sharks, um, but it's about business investors. And they, there's four of them that come and kind of sit in this room with chairs. And they're kind of uh, almost like a panel of judges, I guess. And then every episode, they bring people into this room to ask and make a sales pitch to ask these investors for money. And even if you've never watched the show Shark Tank before, um, you probably can imagine what, how that kind of goes, right? These people, they, they walk into the room and they're all, you know, dressed up perfectly and they're smiling and they're looking confident and they have this sales pitch that's perfectly rehearsed and, and they, they smile and they're confident and they, they, sh they give this sales pitch. And, and sometimes the, um, the investors will ask them a question and they're, they always have all the answers. They're always confident and, you know, everything's positive. Everything's looking good. Um, but I, what if, just imagine with me, if one time we turn on Shark Tank and in walks this person and they're in sweats and their hair's all disheveled and it's like really obvious they haven't showered in like three days. And they walk into this room of investors, these like high level business, highly successful business people. And they walk in and they're like, hey guys, listen, I know I was supposed to have like a whole thing, a whole pitch. And I just, I don't think I can do it today, man. It has been a rough few days. And matter of fact, it's been a rough few months. And I, you know, at my business, there's some, there's some problems and I don't know how we're gonna solve them, just to be honest. You know, I, 
maybe things will work out or may, maybe they won't. Can you imagine how those business investors would react in that moment? Can you imagine how we would react if, if you saw that on television? Like I, I can kind of feel like embarrassed for that person, right? There's like a shame that, that rises up as we think about that. But I wonder if we take that same analogy and, and apply it to Jesus, how is that similar? Because I think a lot of us approach Jesus the same way that people approach the shark tank. We want to approach Jesus feeling confident. We want to walk in dressed correctly, smiling, feeling good about our lives, and we want to feel solid and strong. But, but what if we came to him more like the last person that I talked about, untidy, disheveled, maybe sorrowful or depressed or broken, unprepared. We're just like, Jesus, here I am in all my mess. How do you think Jesus would respond? How would he engage with us in that moment? Well, we don't have to wonder because Jesus speaks about this in a really powerful but simple verse in the book of Matthew. So I wanna just look at this, this statement from Jesus in Matthew chapter 11 in verse 28. Listen to Jesus's words here. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Do you notice who he's talking to? People who are weary, people who are tired. Anybody ever been there? I know I've been there. And he says, come to me like that. That's who I want. That's who I'm calling. One author, I loved how he said it. He says it like this. Jesus is calling not to the strong and self-sufficient, but to the weak and the weary. So which one of those are we? Are we coming to him and trying to be strong and self-sufficient? Or do we come to him in our weakness, in our brokenness, in our weariness? I love how James 4, 6 puts this. It says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That word resist there, it means God actively fights against people who are prideful. So if we're prideful, what does that mean? It means that we come before him and we're like, I'm good. I got it all figured out. I'm doing, I'm doing all right. Like, you know, I've, I've, I've got a pretty good life. I'm living pretty solid. I'm pretty, feeling good. You know, no issues really going on. That's the prideful person. And what does it say? God resists them. I don't know about you, but if there's one being in the universe that I don't want resisting me, it's the God who created everything. And it says, who, who comes to him and gives him grace? Who, who, what person comes to God and he gives them grace? It's the humble person, the person who comes broken, who realizes, God, I need you. That's who he gives grace. But I, I think no matter how many times we read it, it's very difficult for us to really wrap our minds around this. And so what I wanna do is take a few minutes and look at three different stories in scripture where people come to Jesus in their brokenness with all different kinds of messes and watch how Jesus engages and how he responds. So first, I wanna show you a, a story where someone comes to Jesus in the midst of desperation. Have you ever been desperate? I know I've been desperate. What if we came to Jesus in the midst of our desperation? There's a story about this in Mark chapter five. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. Verse 25, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many, many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I can just touch his clothes, I will be healed. So to start with, we have this woman who has a medical issue for 12 years and she does everything she can think of. She goes to every doctor and she gives so much, she's spending so much money. And it says that not only did she suffer under these doctor's cares, but things are actually just getting worse. And so finally she gets desperate and she says, I'm going to Jesus. How do I know she was desperate? Because in ancient Jewish culture, there was this, this societal rule about who was clean and unclean. And she would have been considered unclean. So she would have been excluded from society. And yet she says, you know what? I don't even care. I'm so desperate. I'm coming to Jesus anyway. I have to get to Jesus. And how does he respond to this? This woman in her desperation, here's what he says to her in verse 34. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Jesus meets her in the midst of her desperation. He calls her daughter. 
He heals her and frees her from her suffering. And, and listen, hear me, hear me clearly on this. I can't promise that Jesus will fix whatever problem is in your life, but I can promise that he will meet you in your suffering and your desperation, just like he did with this woman. What about doubt? Is it possible to approach Jesus with doubt? Like, isn't Jesus all about faith? I'll show you just a really fascinating story here in the book of Mark chapter nine. This is incredible. This man brings his son to Jesus because his son has a demon in him. And listen to what the man says to Jesus in verse 17. He says, teacher, I brought my son to you for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out and they were not able. And Jesus asked the man, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. So this man brings his son who he's, 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 his heart is broken for his son. He brings him to the disciples and the disciples cannot help him. And so now there's doubt in his heart. And he, you kind of hear that come out of his words, right? Jesus actually picks up on it. In uh, verse 23, Jesus says to him, if you can, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. But watch, watch what this man says to Jesus. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. So we have a man here who comes to Jesus, doubts and all. He says to Jesus, I believe in you, but I have doubts. Will you help me? Will you meet me in this place of doubt? And let's see how Jesus responds to this. Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit saying to him, to it, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. So yet again, Jesus meets this person, this man in the midst of his brokenness and doubt. I love how one author put it. He said, this is an imperfect man clinging imperfectly to a perfect savior. And again, I can't promise that Jesus will always, every single time, fix whatever the circumstance or problem is in your life. But I can promise you that he will meet you in the midst of your doubt, just like he did with this man. What about confusion? I don't know if you've ever had confusion in your life, but there's this passage in Matthew 11 uh, where we, we sort of hear a little bit more about uh, John the, the baptizer. John the baptizer, real quick, um, he was a very powerful speaker and teacher. And early in Jesus's ministry, John was actually one of the first people to proclaim Jesus as the Messiah. He said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So John makes a clear statement that Jesus is the Messiah. But eventually he's thrown in prison for his, his, uh, his preaching and so in prison, he hears about Jesus and he hears about the ministry of Jesus and what Jesus is doing and what he's saying. And we don't know all the details, but something happens inside of John. He gets confused. At first he was confident, this is the guy, this is the Messiah, but he slowly gets a little confused. Like I had these thoughts about what the Messiah would be like, about what he would do. And Jesus, you're not quite meeting my expectations. Have you ever been there? We have these thoughts about how life should go or how a certain relationship or how the world should be. And it's like, Jesus, what is going on? This isn't what I thought. That, what, what are you up to? I'm so confused by this. And let's see how Jesus responds to John in that place of confusion. Matthew chapter 11, verse two says this. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent words by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? That's after he already proclaimed Jesus as the Messiah. You can hear the confusion there. But Jesus answered him, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. Jesus does not criticize John. He does not um, get upset at John for being confused. No, he meets John in the midst of that confusion. 
He answers his question. He reassures him. He says, John, I get it. You're confused. I know I'm not doing it exactly how you thought I would, but you can still trust me. I'm still the Messiah. And notice here, this is a perfect example of what we've been saying because Jesus does not break John out of prison. At the end of this story, John is still just as incarcerated as he was before. But what did Jesus do? He met him in his confusion and he will always meet us in our confusion as well when we go to him in that place. So those are just a few examples, just just a sampling. There are so many other stories where people come to Jesus broken in all different ways, all different flavors of brokenness, and he always meets them there. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about it, for the most part, the people that Jesus calls out and criticizes were not these broken people, but the religious leaders. The people that came to Jesus pretending like it was fine, like, oh, we're good, I don't need anything. You know, Jesus, oh, you're cool, but so are we. Like, that's who Jesus called out. That's who he criticized. And the the thing that's scary to me is that this is all over in our culture. We live in a culture where we're not comfortable, we're not ready or able in a lot of times to be in a state of need with other people. We want to look like we have it all together. We want to manage how someone sees us. And that, you know, that's a challenge in and of itself. But when that starts getting into, creeping into how we see Jesus and how we engage with Jesus, now it's become a tool of Satan and it becomes shame in our hearts. That's one of Satan's favorite tools, shame. And what I think is interesting is that Satan wants us to think I could never come to Jesus like this. The the, the way I'm broken, the issues I'm wrestling with, I could never come to him like this. And that statement, that lie from Satan, that is something he uses with Christians and non-Christians. So if you're here and maybe you're here and you're you're new at Grace, you're a guest, uh, maybe you've never trusted in Jesus before, uh, you're still kind of checking it out, maybe evaluate if shame is one of the reasons you've been holding off. This thought of, of, really, Jesus could love me? Jesus could forgive me and accept me after everything I've done? You hear the lie of shame in that. Or if you're here, maybe you're here and you've been saved, you've been following Jesus for 50 years. There are still days, probably, if you're like everybody, if you're like me, you you come to Jesus, you sit down to pray and you're like, how can I approach you, Jesus? After the day I had, after the, the way I spoke to my family or the thoughts I've been wrestling with today, how could I possibly come before you in this way, in this moment? But remember, this is huge. That is 100% opposite of the gospel. You know, we've been talking about the gospel for the last few weeks and, and the gospel, the core of the gospel, if you remember, is us coming before Jesus broken. We come helpless and we say, Jesus, we need you. I cannot fix this problem on my own. I cannot, I can make myself look a little better, but it's a waste of time. You're the one that I need. I need you to rescue me from my sin and brokenness. That's what the gospel is all about. We come to Jesus broken and he makes us whole. And that's just as true whether you've been a Christian for 30 years or whether you still have yet to begin your walk with him. A few months ago, um, I had this plan in place. I was going to take a three-day trip, uh, like, like retreat at this cabin. And I was really excited about it. It was supposed to be this time of being sort of alone and, and me and Jesus hanging out at this cabin. And it was a beautiful space. This cabin's like perched on a cliff with an incredible view. So I drive over there, I get my car unloaded and I sit down to like have this moment, right? And I'm supposed to be all holy, but all I can feel is that my heart is not there. I just feel like I can't even bring myself to to engage with scripture. I can't even bring myself to pray or sing a worship song. And I'm sitting there and I'm getting frustrated. And finally, I'm, I'm sitting in one of those outdoor Adirondack chairs. I'm looking at this beautiful view and I'm like, this is crazy. But I finally, I said out loud, I literally said out loud, well, Jesus, I, I got nothing. I, I don't have a verse. I don't have a, a prayer, but I wanna be with you. And so maybe we can just sit here and be quiet. And I just sat there. And, and it was a special moment. I don't, it's not that I never felt broken like that, but I don't know that I'd ever been so honest with Jesus when my heart was in, not in the right place. I brought him my brokenness. I came to him in the midst of that brokenness and he met me in a really special way. And listen, hear me. I'm not saying it has to go that way or that that's how it's gonna have to be with you. You're gonna have your own encounters with Jesus. But my point is this, are you ready to engage him in the midst of the brokenness? 
That is the question that Jesus is posing to each of us. He doesn't want some edited and cleaned up version of you. He just wants you to come to him. So just before we move out of this portion of the service, the team here at Washingtonville, they're gonna come with one more song and, and this, is, this is an important moment. During this song, here's what I want you to remember. We don't go to Jesus once we're clean. We go to Jesus to be made clean. We don't go to Jesus once we're healthy. We go to be healed. We don't go to Jesus once we're at peace. We go to him to find peace. So will you seek him out? Will you go to him in those moments? Go to him no matter how you feel. No matter what shame might be telling you, will you go to him? Will you go to him when your love for him isn't as strong as you think it should be? Will you go to him when you have doubt and uncertainty, when you have anger or frustration, when you're in the midst of sorrow and grief? Go to him. He is the place to bring all of our brokenness and he will meet you there. As the team leads us in this song all, all across our campuses, I want you to just engage however Jesus is leading you. Will you let him work in your heart in these minutes that we have left? Maybe it needs to be a time of, of singing and worship, or maybe it's a time of quiet gratitude and you think, Jesus, you love me like this? Or maybe it needs to be a declaration where you say, I will no longer let shame separate me from my savior. However Jesus is working in your heart across all of our campuses here in this room, will you engage with him? Our hope is that whatever that needs to be, whatever this time needs to be, that this song will help cement these truths in your heart. Let this be a moment where you come to Jesus exactly as you are. Let's come to him together. Oh, how long my heart has struggled with its fear and unbelief. Oh, my heavy laden spirit at the cross would find relief. I have wandered in this darkness, not a ray of light within, but my faith at last has led me to the cross with all my sin. And only I find my hope. I'm 
I'm finding everything I need. I find my rest. Would you stand together all across our campuses? Let's stand to our feet and let's sing it out together. I find my hope. Revelation chapter three, Jesus is speaking and he says this, I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. So as we've looked at our relationships with Jesus, what have you seen? What has he shown you? Is there sin in your life that's holding you back? Will you repent from that this week and turn to him? Is there work you've been doing for Jesus that has become a distraction? Will you repent from that and begin changing this week? Has your tradition, the way you approach Jesus, has that become a barrier between you and him? Will you turn from that this week? Have you been letting shame hold you back from becoming closer to him? Will you let that go and turn from that this week? Jesus is there standing at the door knocking, but will we open and let him in? Jesus, we do that now. Every day, every moment of our lives, we want to open the door and welcome you more and more into our lives. And we thank you, we worship you because you have said that as we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. We love you. We admit our need for you every minute, every day, every moment. Draw us nearer, even now, even this week. We love you. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen.